Hi guys, welcome back to the channel, I'm the Viking of course, and this is my breakdown of the Family Fair article that was released today, documenting what happened with just like 17 from Zack Snyder's point of view and his wife, Deborah Schneider, detailing the toxic fan base, the behind the scenes drama, and what led to this movie now being released. It's an interesting article, it's a very emotional one, it's heartbreaking, and I wanted to be respectful towards it and read out the entire thing, and then break it down and give my thoughts on it. By also listening to your guys' thoughts, I asked you on Twitter what was your thoughts on the Vanity Fair article and I'll be respectful to all perspectives because many people disagree on many elements of the article and agree with many elements of the article but it's important to be respectful and listen to everybody's thoughts but this article is very much a heavy one and if you're kind of prone to not being responsive to negative stuff too well or heartbreaking stuff, maybe this article isn't one for you to read but then again, it's real life, it's interesting, and it shows and documents what happened over the last three years with the Snyder Cut very well. And uh, let's just get into it, okay? So Justice League, the shocking, accelerating heartbreak, true story of hashtag Snyder Cut. A demoralizing battle with Warner Brothers, a devastating personal tragedy, a fan base he couldn't control, Zack Snyder tells Vanity Fair why he quit Justice League and why he's returned to complete a cut that's reached medical status this was written by anthony brezican february 22nd 2021 zack snyder the director of justice league has never seen justice league his name is in the credits as the filmmaker but he's never sat through the version released to the world three years ago his wife deborah who produced the movie advised him not to in late 2017 months after the couple cut ties with the superhero epic and men an increasingly demoralizing battle with warner brothers Deborah Steiner sat in the screen room on the studio lot alongside Christopher Nolan, one of the movie's executive producers, as well as the director of the Dark Knight trilogy. She braced herself as the lights went down. It was just, it's a weird experience, she says now. I don't know how many people have that experience. You've worked on something for a long time, and then you leave, and then you see what happened to it. What happened to Justice League was a crisis of infinite doubt. A team of executives who lost faith in the architect of their faltering comic book movie empire and a director in the midst of a family tragedy that sapped him out of the will to fight. Josh Whedon, a director from another universe, the Marvel Cinematic One, left the Avengers after two movies and crossed over to comics rival DC, picking up Justice League not where Snyder left off, but remaking it with extensive rewrites and hurried reshoots just as the studio demanded. On November 17, 2017, the team-up between Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Aquaman and The Flash didn't so much debut in theatres as crash into them. It was sneered at by critics, shrugged at by baffled moviegoers, and all but disowned by those who created it. Whedon has since been accused of unprofessional and abusive behaviour on set. The director declined repeated requests for a comment. He left his name off the movie except to claim a shared writing credit with Chris Terrio who had written Snyder's previous installment, 2016's Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Publicly, everyone close to the movie practiced their smiles and rehearsed their talking points in the hopes of doing no further damage to the project. Not that it helped much. The movie earned $657 million globally, which sounds like a lot of money until you consider the nearly $300 million budget, including the reported $25 million for Whedon's reworking, plus a conservative an estimate of 100 million to 150 million in marketing costs. Factor in the sizable cut theaters take from the box office, and a return of only 657 million is a clear money loser. Six months later, Just League's box office was dwarfed by Marvel's own all star showcase, Avengers Infinity War, which flexed its muscles at 2 billion. After their private screening of, Whedon, of the Weeden Cut, Nolan and Deborah Snyder emerged into the light with a shared mission. They came and they just said, you can never see that movie, Zack Snyder says during his lunch at his Pasadena office. Because I knew it would break his heart, his wife adds. That might seem overly dramatic. It's just show business after all. But the Snyder's heart had already been through a lot. The battle over Justice League was agonising. But it wasn't the worst thing to happen to their family that year, not even close. Professionally, at least things had vastly improved. For years, DC fans and Snyder enthusiasts who worshipped his high-octane brawn fests like his Dawn of the Dead remake, his ancient Greek 
Battle Saga 300 and his Twisted Watchmen adaptation beat a drum on social media demanding, demanding, demanding that Warner Brothers return Justice League to its original filmmaker and allow him to share his version of the movie. They dubbed it the Snyder Cut. The fans could be clever, but many were horrifically toxic. All of them were relentless, and they grew more numerous over time. Last May, they finally got their wish when Warner Brothers saw the potential to leverage all the free publicity and do something unprecedented on its upstart streaming service, HBO Max. It's not uncommon for directors to lose creative control of a big budget studio spectacle, or for other filmmakers to step in. But it's unheard of for a studio to return to an exiled filmmaker and offer back the power and creative freedom it has yanked away, especially when some of the beloved and lucrative characters in pop culture history are involved. The Snyder Cut is coming on March 18th. It's a Hollywood ending for a Hollywood story, but for the truly devastating thing that happened to Zack Snyder and his loved ones in 2017, there can be no fix, no do-over. In the throes of conflict with Warner Brothers, the Snyder's 20-year-old daughter, home from college and in the middle of a long struggle with depression, took her own life. After two years spent largely focused on their children and extended family, Zack and Deborah Snyder went back to work, a difficult but vital part of the healing process. When they spoke to Vanity Fair for the first for the story, they were complete, completing Army of the Dead, a zombie-filled heist that will launch a new multi-pronged franchise for Netflix, as well as restoring Zack's original vision for Justice League. The latter will be a four-hour event for HBO Max that will raise money for suicide prevention programs that could help spare others the grief that shook his family. It's such a lighting strike in the centre of this world, Saga, Snyder says of his daughter, Autumn's death. It has inform, informed everything we've done since. Their daughter's death was the reason the Snyder, Snyders walked away from Justice League, realising their fight and spirit was needed at home with their other children and with each other, rather than a losing battle with a powerful studio. Now she is the main reason he decided to come back. At the end of the movie, it says for Autumn, Snyder says, sitting in the shadows of a darkened editing suit, suite, frames from the movie frozen on the screen, behind him. When he talks about his daughter, the otherwise scrappy 54-year-old filmmaker always looks away. Without her, this absolutely would not have happened. Zach and his, t- and his then wife, Denise Weber, adopted Autumn when she was one. A little over one, he says, smiling at the memory of her wild energy. Still an infant, but crazy. Autumn was slightly older than the, than the couple's son, Eli. They had two more children before they divorced. Snyder had two sons with line producer Kirsten Elan before marrying Deborah, his long-time producing partner in 2004 with whom he adopted two more children. The filmmaker has often said being an adoptive father is one of the reasons he was so invested in the story of Kal-El, a powerful being who became Superman thanks to the love and care of Jonathan and Martha Kent. More than three years after Autumn's death, Snyder still slips between the past and present tense when talking about her. She's the only dork, he says of the family. She was the only one. The rest of them, he shrugs. Today, Eli is interested in filmmaking, but Autumn was the only one of his children who matched her dad's kid-like enthusiasm for gods, monsters, aliens and superheroes. She's super creative, he says. She was a writer. She She was at Sarah Lawrence to be a writer. Snyder swipes through his phone to show a selfie took in the Letterman jacket worn by Ray Fisher's character in Justice League. A football star wounded in a car accident and rebuilt by his scientist father into the half-robot warrior Cyborg. Autumn had been in therapy and on medications, but the depression remained brutal. She was always wondering about her worst. What is my worst? What am I supposed to do? What am I about? Snyder stumbles on his words, his eyes glassy, the conversation was like, of course you're amazing. What do you mean you're worth? You're worth more than anything in the world. And she would just be like, yeah. Snyder says Autumn used writing to vent her pain, to channel into words that might contain it or explain it. She adored sci-fi. Her main characters are always in this battle with things from another dimension that no one can see, says Snyder. But it's a serious war, and that war was happening to her every day. I think so many people are in that battle and they smile and nod at you. 
The fact that the studio had lost faith in Snyder's ability to make Justice League seemed mundane and pointless after Autumn's death. It's such a lightning strike at the centre of this whole saga, says Snyder. And in a lot of ways, it has informed everything we've done since. The Snyders tried to keep going for two months after Autumn's death, finding solace in finishing Justice League, but by then, by then the situation with Warner Bros. had imploded. The official story was that the Snyder, Snyders were voluntarily leaving the movie due to a family tragedy, and that Zack had handpicked Whedon to complete the movie he had planned, only half of that was true. In 2010, when he first began working on DC movies with Warner Bros., Snyder was prom- promoted as a visionary director, though critics sometimes differed. Even his hits could be dis- diverse, decisive. He emerged from music videos and commercials with the, ha- with the breakout remake of Dawn of the Dead in 2004 and followed it up with the otherworldly, visually audacious tale of Resistance 300, which became a box office hit in 2017, or 27, 2007. Given his choice of projects, Snyder picked Watchmen, the iconic graphic novel that scorned the classic tropes of superhero storytelling and explored the corrupting nature of power. His 2009 adaptation upended comic book expectations just as Hollywood was building epic new franchises. Snyder then made a pair of box office disappointments, a digitally animated adventure about warring owls called Legends of the Guardians and the surreal, and some would say sexist, movie Sucker Punch, before being called to take on Legend, among Legends, Superman. When it debuted in 2013, Man of Steel established Henry Cavill as an object of global thirst. Just as 300 had done for Jared Butler and his washboard abs, Snyder's twist was to present a conflicted Clark Kent rather than the sunny alter ego played by Christopher Reeve. Snyder's Superman was willing to kill for what he thought was right, which many longtime fans of the character found a uh, reprisal. And though he still saved the world, he never felt like he truly belonged in it. The studio had hoped for more than $668 million it made at the box office, but Man of Steel fared well enough for Snyder to get another shot, this time bringing Ben Affleck into the universe as Bruce Wayne in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. The subtitle was a giveaway. This would be a prologue to Justice League, a superhero crossover event that some moviegoers had been pining for forever. Snyder wasn't just making a big budget temple, he'd become the architect of the entire DC cinematic universe. And his casting choices continued to renaissance. He chose Gal Gadot to play Wonder Woman in Batman v Superman and produced Patty Jenkins' standalone movie about the Amazonian princess. I remember Gal saying to me, Zach, I was going to quit the business. I was getting ready to just move back to Tel-, Tel Aviv and just live there. I was done with Hollywood. I was going to do this one more edition. Then she came in and I was like, that's my Wonder Woman. Now she's the whole world. As with Man of Steel, Snyder continued to challenge expectations and norms, which sometimes led to pushback from the studio and fans. Aquaman, for instance, had always looked waspy in the comics. In the casting role for Batman v Superman, Snyder decided to forego the blonde hair and blue eyes of the comic book hero in favour of the long, dark locks and smoky gaze of Jason Momoa, who would come in to audition for Bruce Wayne. He's a Pacific Islander. There's a connection to the sea. One of his Aquaman. He remembers thinking... Everyone was like, you're insane. That's not a thing. It became part of a pattern. The studio gave Snyder the power to go anywhere he chose with with most valuable characters and he always went somewhere other than than what they wanted. The director director says, still, to his credit, credit, all the recent DC films have used Snyder's universe as a foundation. Even Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey, which take place in his version of Gotham City. The upcoming Flash film will connect all the DC films by richarding through multiple universes, with Michael Keaton's Batman appearing alongside Affleck's. But harsh reviews for Batman v Superman demolished Warner Brothers' confidence in Snyder. Even the director's champions, like production head Greg Silverman, were worried. When Batman v Superman came out and we didn't get it, we, we got a negative reaction from the fans, it was disheartening. For all of us, says Silverman, now the founder and head of independent content company Stampede Ventures. Zack had made these movies like 300 that were such crowd pleasers. And that was our job, to make crowd pleasers. And here, we've made a movie together that didn't really please the audience. Marvel Studio movies 
whose success exerted so much pressure on the DC team, hit on a formula that mirrored their comic book roots, telling stories about relatable everyday people grappling with sudden phenomenal powers. Snyder's DC Universe approached its superheroes from the opposite direction, I disagree, depicting gods and immortals who are at ease wielding cosmic strengths but strained to be human and connect to the ordinary world. The director envisioned this as operatic, tragic and perhaps a more challenging type of comic book storytelling, but Warner Brothers feared it made his heroes gloomy, their abilities a curse. Diane Nelson, who was president of DC Entertainment at the time, said she appreciated that Snyder was more into deconstructing the familiar than just recapitulating it. Snyder is a masterful visual storyteller who goes deep on individual characters. For some people, that is amazing. And for other people, that becomes a problem because they have a fixed opinion about who these DC characters are and not. In 2016, as principal of photography got underway on Justice League in the United Kingdom, rumours that Snyder had been fired from the film that didn't happen. But Warner Brothers, then chairman and CEO Kevin Tushihara, did assign watchdogs in the form of DC Entertainment creative chief Jeff Johns and Warner Brothers co-production head John Berg. Berg, who is now production president at Stampede, recalls that duty as a low point. It was really tricky and not a position that I loved, to be honest. I tried to be forthright about what I taught creatively. My job was to try and meditate between a creator whose vision is instinctually dark and a studio that perceived rightly or wrong that the fans wanted something lighter. I was respectful of the director and didn't pursue things that were coming at me from the corporate side that I thought worked in the line with what would make the best movie. Schneider knew why Johns and Berg were on the set. He could say babysit, he says. Many filmmakers would have bristed at the intrusion, but he was gracious. It didn't bother me too much. They weren't that threatening. I just felt the ideas they did have were that they were trying to inject humour and stuff like that. It wasn't anything that was too outrageous. But Warner Brothers did nick some of the more sweeping notions for Justice League, like adding a romance between Ben Affleck's Batman, Bruce Wayne, and Amy Adams' Lois Lane, who was mourning Superman's death in the previous film. The intention was that Bruce fell in love with Lois and then realised that the only way to save the world was to bring Superman back to life, says Snyder. So he had this insane conflict between Lois, of course, was still in love with Superman. We had this beautiful speech where Bruce said to Alfred, I never had a life outside of this cave. I never imagined a world for me beyond this. But this woman makes me think that if I can get this group of gods together, then my job is done. I can quit. I can stop. And of course, that doesn't work out for him. It didn't work out for Snyder either. The studio said no. The downside of making epics in the studio studio's financial expectations for Justice League Warner Brothers wanted a big round billion dollars in global box office, which Snyder's movies have never reached. In January 2017, the director showed his cut to Kevin Tushihara. It did not go well. According to Snyder and others, Tishihara, who resigned from Warner Brothers in 2019 and met a sexual misconduct scandal involving the aspiring actress Charlotte Kirk, declined an interview request. Among the issues with the length of the movie, there was a mandate from Kevin Tushihara that the movie be two hours long, says Snyder. That order had a paradoxical impact uh, because it meant eliminating much of the heart and humour the studio also wanted. Like a comical romantic subplot between Ezra Miller's Flash and Kirstie Clemens' Iris, the latter of whom was absent entirely from the Whedon film. On the day Fanny Fair visited his office, Snyder was working on finalising the music for the restored scene in which the Flash rescued her from a car crash. Ooh, pretty interesting. Snyder also saw a bigger structural problem with the make it shorter order. How am I supposed to introduce six characters and an alien with potential for world domination in two hours? I mean, I can do it. It can be done. Clearly it was done. He says referring to Whedon's version. But I didn't see it. Reports that Snyder himself asked Whedon for help were false. Johns, one of the studio's appointed babysitters, had been planning a Batgirl movie with Whedon. And Snyder and others says Johns recruited him to rewrite for Justice League. Johns' representations didn't respond to a request for comment. Once again, Snyder was gracious and even hopeful. I thought maybe he could write some cool scenes. I thought that would be fun. 
Soon, it became clear that Warner Brothers was giving Whedon more and more power. He would not just advise during reshoots, but also do some directing himself. Snyder says he only had one conversation with Whedon about the studio's notes, reeling from Autumn's debt and finding anguish, anguish in their work rather than relief. Zack and Deborah quit. We just lost the will to fight that fight in a lot of ways, says Snyder. All of us, the whole family, were just so broken by losing Autumn that having those conversations in the middle of it really became... I was like, really? Frankly, I think we did the right thing because I think we would have been either incredibly belligerent or we just rolled over. One by one, he called members of his cast and crew. I remember I was in a movie theater. Coincidentally enough, Ray Fisher said on the set of Snyder's reshoots last fall, I was walking into the AMC theater in Times Square and I got the call from Zach and he was saying that he had to deal with stuff with the fam and he was having to step away. I had a trillion questions. My heart sank. Whedon rewrote and reshot about three quarters of Justice League. From what Snyder can gather, when fans ask him about details of the movie that bears his name, he usually has no idea what they're talking about. Worst of all, for one of us, Whedon didn't exactly save the movie. When we get to see what Josh actually did, it was stupid, says a studio executive. The robber on the rooftop, so goofy and awful. The Russian family, so useless and pointless. Everyone knew it. It was so awkward because nobody wanted to admit what a piece of shit it was. Justice League opened November 17th, 2017 and cratered. Because Cavill had been making Mission Impossible Fallout during the reshoots, Wheaton's team had to digitally erase his moustache in Justice League. The jokes fell flat and behind the scenes some of the cast had revolted. Fisher had publicly claimed Wheaton was abusive on set and that Warner Brothers executives enabled his actions. Gadot told the Los Angeles Times that she also had a negative experience with Wheaton, which she reported to the higher ups. After concluding its investigation, Warner Brothers announced that remedial action had been taken, though the studio didn't offer specifics. Days before the announcement, HBO, a division of Warner Media, parted ways with Whedon on the sci-fi series The Nevers. Fisher's, Fish, Fisher continues to clash with the studio and has expect, expressed dismay at the outcome of its investigation. The cast were very loyal to Zack and they were hurting for him, says Nelson, the former DC president. It would have been a different environment for any new director to walk into. I have no doubt about that. But then how Josh chose to handle that is Josh to live with. In the aftermath of Whedon's version, a new narrative arose on social media. Hashtag released the Snyder Cut. Snyder gradually began to encourage the movement. It was hardly the first thing on his mind. From the time we left, says Snyder, it was not a great year. We did a lot of stuff with family. It was, it was really important. An important year. That year together became two. After grieving Autumn and starting to heal with his family, he began work on Army of the Dead. A visceral, funny and exceedingly dark smash and grab story of an elite strike team that goes into a zombie overrun Las Vegas to retrieve a hidden fortune before the hot sun is nuked. The zombie virus emerges from Area 51 so aliens may be involved too. During a day-long interview, Snyder giddily scans through the concept art for an accompanying animated series, approving vehicles, uh, weapons, supernatural beings. He makes suggestions for changes to his team of artists, all working remotely via Zoom. Behind him on the wall, lent bookshelf, there's a frame with two photos, Autumn and Eli in their bathing suits as toddlers, beaming with the same smiles as their dad as he assesses his monsters. The Army of the Dead movie is a lot to tackle, and the related prequel and animated series even more all-consuming. Scott Stuber, head of original films at Netflix, says it's a chance to build a world with a filmmaker who's hungry to return. Zack went through something very difficult, and I think he probably realised, like we all do, it's okay to be vulnerable. For those of us lucky enough to know him and Deborah, he's a very soulful, kind, thoughtful human being. He's got this facade of big action movies and all these bravado things, but there's a sweet kindness to him. At a time of stories of abusive creators, Snyder is uh, an anomaly. Even executives who were sometimes at odds with him agree that he's genuinely nice. I'd be stronger than that, says Silverman. He's a wonderful guy and fostered a wonderful working environment on his sets. He really valued the crew. He valued his cast. Snyder's movies tend to be about strength and what it means to wheel it. Maybe it was inevitable. 
Edible. That he'd eventually not only join the hashtag release the Snyder Cut bandwagon, but begin driving it. When Snyder left Warner Brothers, he took his laptop, which had the Justice League sticker. On the hard drive was his original, nearly four hour version. It was devoid of visual effects, music, and all the fine tuning that makes a movie a movie. It was also in black and white. To him, it was a memento. He thought we would just show it to random people who stopped by, like our friends or whatever. Rather than fade away, the demand of the Snyder Cut gained momentum over the years. Groups paid to have single engine airplanes fly, released the Snyder Cut banner around the around Warner Brothers studio lot in Burbank, and the annual Comic Con gathering in San Diego last year, fans pooled resources to buy a Times Square billboard. A noxious contagion of followers, though, didn't just advocate for the movie, but also used social media to attack people who were critical of Snyder or their cause. Maybe they hoped to silence uh, dissenters, or maybe they were just trolled being trolls. In any case, film journalists with negative takes r- reported getting swarmed with insults and even threats. Unfortunately, I think a lot of online fandom and fandom culture is headed in this very toxic direction, says Kaylee Donaldson, who writes to Punjabi.com. Is especially strong from Snyder cult, uh, Snyder cut alcohols. She adds, perhaps because they respond misguidedly to the director's tales of loner heroes in a hostile world. I don't get this from the Birds of Prey fans or the Shazam fans, says Donaldson. I got a little bit from Joker fans, but nowhere near the same level. Nonetheless, she's looking forward to Snyder's movie. I think 300 is a great, is great fun. I think the first 10 minutes of Watchmen are some of the best things any superhero movie has ever done. Even if she doesn't end up liking the Snyder Cut, she says, I would rather watch one person's chaos than a committee's snooze fest. Drea, Drea Letamendi, a clinical psychologist who explores superhero archetypes on the Arkham Sessions podcast, notes that fans get especially aggressive on social media when they feel they've been denied something. What I've observed is an enduring false sense of ownership which can manifest as abuse, threats, and strong, intense reactions when a story doesn't go their way, she says. Fighting for the unseen cut of the film became a cause. In some quarters, the worst behavior, they're shouting and people are listening to them, even if it's negative comments, they're getting positive reinforcements to continue down that path. The trolls may have actually held the movement held the movement back, like looters at an otherwise peaceful demonstration Snyder cringes at descriptions of the abusive tactics. I 100% think it's wrong, he says. I don't think that anyone should be calling anyone anything. I've always tried to give people in the fandom attention who do good things. November 2019 brought a sustained hashtag push on Twitter, which Snyder promoted. Gadot and Affleck were now calling for his cut to be released, too. A few days later, Toby Emmerich, chairman of Warner Brothers Pictures Group, called Snyder with an offer. Let's try again. A lot of people at the company, myself included, always felt badly that Zack didn't get to finish his version of the film because of the circumstances, says Emmerich. And so, if there was a way to make it logistically and financially possible, which HBO Max did, and Zack had a willingness to do so, it seemed like a win for everybody. Initially, says Snyder, Warner Brothers just wanted to release the raw footage on his laptop. I was like, that's a no, that's a hard no, he says. And they're like, but why? You can just put it on the, on the rough cut. Snyder didn't trust their motivations. I go, here's why. Three reasons. One, you get the internet off your back, which is probably your main reason for wanting to do this. Two, you get to feel vindicated for making things right, I guess, on some level. And then three, you get a shitty version of the movie that you can just point to and go, see, it's not that good anyway. So maybe I was right. I was like, no chance. I'd rather just have the Snyder Cup be a medical unicorn for all time. Snyder estimates that it costs around $70 million to undo Whedon's redo. For that, HBO Max gets four hours of hotly anticipated programming and the Hollywood comeback story of a lifetime. Snyder himself gets nothing. I'm not getting paid, he says. He was paid the first time, of course. This time, he wants credit control and foregoing a fee helped. I don't want to be beholden to anyone. It allowed me to keep my negotiation powers with these people pretty strong. Fisher, for one, who was eager to return... There's not a day that goes by over the last three years I haven't thought about this movie. That I have not sat up at night thinking, what if there was a world where this thing actually does get released, says the actor. Sitting on set in his grayscale motion capture suit, I probably should have let it go. But there was so much that we left behind in this version of the film. It's a completely different movie. 
As for the fan base, the Snyder movement has contributed half a million dollars to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention through the donations, sale of merchandise, and auctions of props. People have been saying, oh, they attack people, says Dapper Snyder, her eyes tearing. But this fan base has saved lives, as many as they wanted something for themselves. They've come together for this amazing cause. You feel so helpless trying to help someone, and you don't know what to do. It's literally life or death. And I felt like we didn't really know where to turn. Rebuilding the story he had always envisioned is what motivates Snyder most. He can go as deep and as dark as he likes. He can say the hell with DC's official timeline for the characters and let this old version of the Justice League story wind up wherever he pleases. He has put Superman in a sleek black suit instead of the iconic blue and red. He's added the Joker. He's reshot the ending when a hero cameo will blow hardcore fans' minds in what may, what may be a divisive move. He's also presenting the movie in a boxy 4x3 fa uh, format rather than the widescreen so that one day it can be watched on IMAX screens. Some may be irritated by seeing Justice League on HBO Max with black bars on either side. Snyder isn't troubled by that. The director is also layering in some deeply personal elements. The movie closes with Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah performed by Alison Crow, a friend who also signed out at Autumn's funeral. It was Autumn's favourite song. Now it's an energy to her. Justice League, however, anyone who feels about it is made of the things and people Snyder loves too. When you think about the catalyst of it, it was a potter. I would have made some pottery to look at for some way through this, he says. But I'm a filmmaker, so you get this giant movie. He wants people to love it. If some don't, he's alright with that. With all of it. Whatever comes, he's okay. What is my word? What am I supposed to do? What am I about? Zack Snyder is answering Autumn's questions for himself. So that article, very interesting. It delves deep into what happened in 2017. It debunks some of the stuff that Zack Snyder was fired. It debunks that some of the stuff that Zack Snyder handpicked Whedon. It debunks all that stuff. John Berg, Jeff Johns were picked by the studio to be on set, to be babysitters, to make sure humour was being put into this movie. So all those things have been confirmed in this article right now. Warner Bros. wanted to release the movie unfinished. And Zack Snyder says no for three reasons. One, it, it gets the fans off your back. Two, it makes you feel ba it makes you feel okay for what you did. And three, you know, it doesn't change the, the movie that you guys presented and it doesn't it, it proves you kind of right saying, oh, this movie would have never been any good anyway. You know, some interesting things. We get a cameo at the end of the movie. It's going to blow hardcore fans' minds. Who's it going to be? Will it be Green Lantern, Jon Stewart, Hal Jordan, Martian Manhunter? Who knows at this stage? But I'm sure Snyder has a big surprise in this movie for all of us fans. It goes into the relationship he's had with Warner Brothers since 300. It talks about his daughter. Very heartbreaking stuff. Very emotional stuff indeed. Some of it's very hard to read. It's very personal. The, the last line from, from Snyder, what Autumn used to say, what is my work? What am I supposed to do? What am I about? Very, very hard, very deep thoughts to have for a young girl many people go through those stuff which led to what happened but you never know how people are feeling in their life and you never know you meet people every day but you never know what's going on in their personal lives you never know what stuff's like at home abuse stuff you just never know what's going on with people that's why i try and be respectful to as many people as i can and especially people who are respectful to me because you just never know what's going on with people in their personal life but this article was detailed and it was interesting and let's just talk about the toxic fan element for a second the Snyder Cut movement has done unbelievable stuff. Half a million for AFSP. Brilliant work. Led to this movie getting released as well, you know, in the right cause, in the right in the right way. But there is a toxic side to it. But every fan has a toxic side. And is there toxic people in the Snyder Cut community? Of course there is. But Snyder says he only gave people attention who deserved it, who did good things. So that's, that shows right there. That Snyder understands that there's toxic people. But he only gives the people who are doing good things and who aren't toxic the time of day. And the thing about toxicity is it happens in all walks of life. Politics, sports, movies, everything. It happens. There's fan bases. There's people. There's just toxic people who are toxic day in and day out. It just happens. That's just the way of life because it's easier to be negative. It's hard to be nice. Even though it doesn't cost anything to be nice. Many people are mean. That's just the way people are. And the narrative from the social media uh, bloggers, it suits them to say, oh, the Snyder Cut movement is, is, is negative. They're trolls. They're toxic. It's easy to say that because it justifies their claims that Snyder's movies are terrible and he has terrible people who support him, even though they write shit about him and his movies and make up things like this. Even in this article, it had that Sucker Punch is a sexist movie. It's, it's not. You know, so 
you know, th that's just the way it is. Snyder always has his haters, but on the other side, he makes his art. He doesn't bow down to anyone. He makes his art for his fan base, for his family, and for him. And that's what's happened in March 18th. His vision has been restored. It's 100% unfiltered Zack Snyder. And I think that's unbelievably heartbreaking and great. And it's for his daughter. And the ending is going to be for Autumn with her favourite song. So I think that's absolutely brilliant. If you have hate towards this man because of his movies, that's okay. You don't like his movies. But if you're showing hate towards him just, just, just to do it, you're not, you have no heart. This man has gone through a terrible tragedy. He's come back after everything and is now getting his movie out there. He's working on Army of the Dead, a zombie film. You know, he'll, he'll continue to work. But he has that tragedy in his life that will always bring him down in moments. But he, it shows something to rise above those dark moments in your past. Or stuff that you are going through and to do something good and do something that you love. Which Snyder is doing. So I, I think that's a, a great advocate. And not only does Zack Snyder make superhero movies. But he's a superhero in his own right to come back from those terrible moments. Not only what Warner Brothers did to him. Not only what online bloggers throw at him every single day. But then the per personal real life importance of tragedy that he had to go through. So Snyder is a, is a, is a monument to people of coming back out of tragedy and that, that, that that's that that can't be that can't be you can't create that that's just that's just in you to do that to come back from these certain certain tragedies and Snyder was able to do it with a smile on his face I think that's unbelievable I really do that article was very interesting very informative it showed us the 2017 scenario what was going on what was the thinking from the studio what what they actually to want they wanted lighter they wanted two hours Kevin Tushahara who, who was ran out of the studio over sexual misconduct allegations you know and it, it, it just the, the proof is in the pudding these are bad people now Toby Emmerich in this kind of always wanted to uh, he said he felt bad now that could just be a publicity stunt from Toby Emmerich to say that oh I'm the good guy now I'm the reason this movie's coming out you know you know but even Snyder calls them out and then says, yeah, you just want to justify your own actions. You just want to make up for the wrongdoing that you did. You know, Snyder kind of had a dig towards them as well there in this article. So that's pretty interesting to see. And it's awesome. What about that Amy Adams, Ben Affleck relationship? Would have been interesting. Very interesting. I don't know if it would have worked. Would have got a uh, controversy again. But something new and interesting. That would have been an interesting element from Bruce Wayne to think, if I get these heroes together, maybe I can actually live my life. But I think Superman is what Lois needs for her to live her life. I think that's the right way to bring is to bring Superman back. So it's an interesting element, and there might be hints towards it in Justice League. Maybe we could see it in the future. So let's have a look what some of you guys had to say on Twitter about the Vanity Fair article. I asked for your thoughts. You guys wrote in the comments. Let's go into those and get an interesting perspective, different perspective of what people uh, felt with this article. I bug you goes. Also, the ignorance of labeling toxic fans as if toxic social media users don't exist in every category of interest. MCU has horrible toxic fans, no mention of them, but because they had no reason to form a movement and voice off the higher ups, they go unnoticed. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, there's Star Wars fandom that has toxic elements, there's the MCU, but they completely ignore those elements. And yeah, uh, Probably just because it's it's Zack Snyder and his fans. I bug you also goes, the article doesn't delve deep enough into the actions of Jeff, Jeff Johns. It doesn't. It makes John Berg and Toby Emmerich not seem that bad. Uh, even Josh Whedon, you know, it doesn't make them seem like absolute villains. But yeah, there probably could have been more information about Jeff Johns. Maybe as time goes on, there will be. Uh, at Batman is me. Uh, if I knew nothing about Justice League or the history of its production behind the scenes, this article would have made me interested in watching the film. For that, I think it's great. And I completely agree. If you were someone who didn't know anything about the toxic side or the Justice League movie or the Snyder Cut or anything like that and you just read this article, it would get you interested to, what, to actually check out this movie and see how this story has come together after all these years. Alex Lobo goes, Vindication, tears, joy, anger, all of the above. Yeah, I agree. I agree. This is a very emotional piece. Uh, you get angry at some parts of it. You're also kind of happy that it's happening now as well. So... Yeah, it does strike a lot of emotion. So it is well written, this article. Carol goes, A lot of good representation of the story, but some clearly pointed perspectives as well, especially towards fans. Also seems to paint Warner Brothers in a better light than probably deserved. What I read was accountability being read as toxicity. Yeah, they do push hard on the toxic fans, <clears throat> which is hard to see, which is bad to see. They could have prompted up more of the AFSP moments. It also makes Warner Brothers not seem that bad, but even Zach goes, I'll give you three reasons why you guys don't want this movie. Zach detailed them out. And cause them out for their shit. Even though at the end, Toby Emmerich's like, yeah, well, I always felt we should have put this movie out here for Zach and helped him, you know? Like, shut up, Toby. You know you didn't. I bug you goes, I think it's a very lazy, it's very lazy for journalists to compare Snyder Cut fandom to any other fandom in existence. What Snyder fans went through was unique. What's happening with the fa film now is unique. There was no precedence. We created it. That's a good point. You know, 
like this is unique and fans are passionate about it because of what happened to Zach back in the day his daughter passing away what he, how he was treated his vision the, the false marketing in the movie all these things led to fans being very angry at Warner Brothers and maybe they had it right but maybe the toxic element that some fans used wasn't the right way retrograde production goes what was needed to be said on Zach's story and his truth after all these years there are some dodgy parts especially about this fandom overall it gives to light to what happened and why Zach is deserving of his second chance and I absolutely agree yes it gives a look at Snyder's perspective Internum Bellum goes happy that we didn't get to see Bruce Wayne effing a widowed Lois Lane okay some people are going to hate that but what I will say is I would have liked to seen it in context if you went to a fan of Batman v Superman and said to them two years before the movie came out or a year before the movie came out I said yeah there's gonna be a big arc in this about the Martyr because their mothers are called Martyr you would have been like what but to see it in context it worked and for to see this in context it might work uh, SP uh, Kudhuri goes painfully beautiful I don't know if it makes sense but I felt I felt pain and hopeful at the same time I agree yeah it's a, it's hard to read but it's a beautiful interesting piece to to see this perspective from Schneider uh, Cynical goes I think it's pretty awesome to learn that Nolan helped protect Zack Snyder from seeing it I think it's hilarious that Berg and Emmerich are trying to act like they're somehow supportive of Snyder's and helpful and think that the Bruce I, I think the Bruce Lois idea is wild as F I hope the cameo is Green Lantern Green Lantern will be awesome and as I said to see Bruce and Lois in context might work but yeah it's like Berg and Emmerich were like, yeah, the studio were giving me were, were giving me stuff to put in the film, but I was like, yeah, I'm not going to really listen to them. I'm going to try and respect Zack Snyder. You know? And then Toby Emmerich was like, yeah, we always wanted to release the movie, you know, for Zack, because we never felt it was right what would have happened. Bullshit! Diego goes, beautiful. My respect for Zack Snyder just increased. Yep. Totally agree. Muhammad, great piece. Yes. Um... Che Ali goes, it was well written article and touching at times. Just wish to highlight some of the good things that many fans came together and did rather than just focus on some, so much of the toxicity in the fandom. Yes, they could have showed more of the AFSP elements. They could have stayed away from the toxic elements. You have to address the toxic elements of this fandom. You, you do have to because many people have been burnt by many people who have been really toxic. So you have to address it in some way. But yes, they could have just showed it a small bit but showed larger good people but negativity sells. Am I right? Jay Fry goes, when you spend five paragraphs talking about a fan based toxicity before making any mention of the much larger contingent that has raged thousands of dollars for suicide prevention and only and the only social media presence <clears throat> interviewed is from someone with a clear history of bias. True, that woman doesn't like Zack Snyder films. She even said it. So she's probably been very uh, controversial in some of her opinions about Zack Snyder movies. And also they spend a long time talking about the negative side. They only spend a brief time talking about some of the positive side. So that is a bit... That is a bit... Um, it's not, it's not good, but negativity sells. Um, Joshy goes, I was not ready for that at all. Apart from the fandom toxicity part, overall article was so beautiful. The way Zach talked about everything, especially Autumn, had me crying like a baby. It's great that we finally have an article that shares the Snyder side of the whole story. Great to see it from their perspective. And yes, it does make you emotional. And yeah, a lot of people against the toxic side element of the fandom in this article. Unfiltered goes, a mix of emotions, you. Yep, exactly. Same, same, same thing I've already... I said how I feel about it. A lot of For Autumn from Nina. Uh, Sahib goes. Uh, for Autumn. Snyder. For Autumn. Exactly. Diego. Some unnecessary editorializing. But otherwise incredibly well written. And lighting. And lighting. And heartbreaking. Yes. A lot of people are having uh, a problem with the toxic side of it. Par Emmy goes. It's cool and heartbreaking. Some king shit in there. Some throwing fans under the bus also. Yeah. There is. <laughs> we'll all agree with that part of it. Uh, official Batman goes the guy seemed pretty biased but the For Autumn part got me cheering up and yes I can't wait to see the end of the movie when it says For Autumn and Hallelujah plays I think it's going to be very beautiful and something for the Snyders to really enjoy and uh, yeah it's just it's just very heartbreaking Andrew goes I felt like they took unnecessary jabs at Sucker Punch and Watchmen but other than that a really good article that shines some light on the reality of everything that happened for the most general audience yeah for general audiences it's good they get to see what exactly what happened a lot of bullshit's been, been said the last few years. Rumours and this is what happened. This is what happened. He was fired and all this crack. No, this article tells you exactly what happened and how it went down. I believe this article when Snyder's perspective is being spoken in this. Kevin goes, my heart breaks for Zach. Reading all the stuff about Autumn and what went down at the studio. He never deserved any of it. Really didn't like the toxic fandom narrative. They kept pushing. Yeah, they kept pushing that big time. But yeah, makes you feel bad for Zach even more and everything they had to go through. Hako goes emotional. It sure was. Mac goes great. 
Nerdy and Money Ways, Dawson from Nerdy and Money Ways goes, the Warner Brothers insider mocking the rooftop robber and Russian family was priceless. I thought that was pretty funny. It even shows you that some of the executives back in the day were like, what are you doing? This movie is absolutely terrible. We should have, sit, we should have stayed with Zack Snyder. And imagine having to greenlit this movie after getting rid, rid of Zack Snyder. But that was funny that some of the executives agree with the fan base. Like, what is this movie? It's ridiculous. Uh, Snyder Cringe goes, beautiful, except for the toxic part, of course. Yeah, but Deborah pointed out the positive side. But you need to acknowledge the toxic side of this fandom as well. Every toxic fandom exists in every element of the world. Politics, sport, movies, everything. There's always a toxic element to it. But I think some of the Snyder fans haven't helped their case in some instance. There's some Snyder fans who will have a debate, who will tell people, who will educate people in a good, respectful manner about the movie, about Zack Snyder and all that kind of thing. But there's other people who will go and will, and will fight toxicity with toxicity, which does not work. And it makes you look worse than the person that you were fighting with toxicity. You know, if you were to show the person how toxic they're being by also being respectful, laying out key points, and you demonstrating how much this movie means to you and why it's important to so many people, instead of just calling someone a piece of shit or an F you or stuff like that, a bitch, you know what I mean? It's about telling these people, but being respectful. You don't have to go to their level. When they're being toxic, let them be toxic, but it doesn't mean that you have to do it. You know, so I think there's a way around that, and many fans in the Standard Cup movement have not grasped that reality of not fighting toxicity with toxicity. There's toxic elements, of course, but you can fight it in a greater way that makes you look better. And even Snyder in the article says, I've always given attention to the fans who have done good things. But I don't think that goes towards people in the fandom who have done bad things, who have been constantly negative online, bullying, been toxic, name calling, stuff like that. Yes, it can be justified by the person that they're going after because they said something bad about AFSP or the Snyder movement or Snyder in general or whatever. Yes, but the way to fight those people is not with toxicity. The way to fight those people is with good heart, good intention, because what they will do is they will turn you into a negative person. They will turn you into the toxic side, even though if their original comic was more toxic than what you said. Because they're the ones who write history. They're the ones with the articles. They're the ones with the blogs. They're the ones who will paint this narrative very much the way that they want to suit their narrative. But if you don't give in to that, if you're respectful, if you're one who details out exactly why you disagree in a nice way, it, it's more impactful. I, 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 I completely agree with that. It's more impactful and it means more. And it makes the person think more. Instead of you just going straight at them and calling them a piece of shit. You know, I think then they get defensive. And then if people online, maybe in the past, said something about Snyder. But they stayed away from Snyder since then because all they think is, oh, toxic fans, toxic fans. It doesn't really work, you know. It, you want to get more people interested in this. And the way to fight them isn't with toxicity. And um, Justice League, uh, Zack Snyder Justice League says, it's, gr it's a great read, but the fan toxicity part is frustrating because they refuse to acknowledge the other side of the same coin. Toxic bloggers and journalists, it will only embottle both sides and cause more divide and toxicity. I agree with that part. Yes, there is toxic elements of uh, bloggers who have said false things about Snyder, like he got fired. So why aren't those people addressed either? You know, that's completely, that's completely right. Uh, Ladislav goes something like this and also I'll be happy because that end cameo is most likely Green Lantern it could be it could be who's to say Zach didn't shoot something in the in the secret in the unknown and uh, you know we just don't know at this stage I bet you there's gonna be one big surprise in this movie that nobody knows about Irfan goes really heartfelt and beautifully written yeah 100% agree the Wanderer goes, it was amazing and now I don't have to buy the book. Yeah, it gives a good detailed history of uh, what happened with the uh, Snyder, Snyder's and the, and the movie. But the one that Sean O'Connor wrote is kind of more of a fan's perspective of it as well, which might be an interesting read. Taru goes, helpful to change the narrative in the long term. Still extremely biased. Sucker Punch is sexist. And MCU is more like the comics. Snyder fans are extremely toxic. Yeah, there was a lot of elements like that. Propping up uh, MCU, of course, but this this <clears throat> this <laughs> journalist might be a little bit biased as well. But <clears throat> look, that's the, that's just their opinion. That's the way they that's the way they think towards it. But I thought overall the piece did exactly what it was supposed to do. It showed how different the Snyder Cut would be. It showed what Snyder went through. It showed what Warner Bros. wanted back in the day. It showed what Jeff Johns, John Berg, all these all these people, Josh Whedon were trying to implement in the time. And it shows that this movie will be 100% unfiltered Zack Snyder. Because what did you think of this article from Vanity Fair? I thought it was interesting. I like some parts of it. I don't like some parts of it. I thought it could have been more uh, beneficial towards AFSP and all those kind of things. 
and Deborah does put that in there. She, like, she was teary eyed saying, like, these people have raised so much money for this huge cause, selfless people. So that's brilliant. Um, Zach, it's great to hear him speak about his movie. Also, heartbreaking to hear him speak about other things as well. But yeah, I thought it was a pretty um, uh, beautiful article altogether, even though some parts I didn't agree with. But guys, let me know below what your thoughts. And yeah, go follow that article if you want to give it a read yourself. That'll be in the description of the video. Comment, like, subscribe, guys. Let me know your thoughts. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about all of this as well. How did it make you feel? Do you disagree with the toxic element? Do you agree that the toxic element has to be acknowledged? But you also have to acknowledge the other side of it as well. The other side of the coin, as some of you guys were saying about the bloggers, uh, how toxic they've been towards Saxon, or not a word about them. Very biased in that sense, you know, very hypocritical from the journalist there. But guys, that's just the way it is. But guys, we got this, we got the movie released. Raised over half a million for AFSP. We've helped the Snyders in their in their journey, which is very important. And we're finally going to get to watch the movie on March 18th. And you never know what it might lead to. This is going to be an epic four-hour movie of Zack Snyder's world. With some surprise in there, an end cameo that's going to blow your mind. Who is it? Green Lantern? Martian Manhunter? Somebody else? Who knows? Who knows? But guys, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. And thanks for watching. Enjoy your life. Do something that makes you happy. You only have one life. This is your life. Do something that you like doing every day. If you do that, you can't be too unhappy.